A very good morning to all my friends far and near. We meet again at Tongod. The first video that we uploaded into the YouTube was about the Heritage Chinese House in Tongod. And we touch a bit about the old church and the old clinic hospital in Tongod. The second video is something special. Where through social media, we were connected to the person who had contributed a lot to Tongod communities back in the early 60s, 70s and throughout 80s. Her contribution towards uh, Tongod communities is so amazing, so awesome, so wow. Her journey from Australia to Borneo to Tongod was so amazing. And it is my privilege to be able to see her, to meet her in person, listen firsthand to her experience, awesome experience about Tongod and about the early days of Tongod communities. So I hope, friends, far and near, to all of you out there, um, you enjoy the video, you enjoy uh, watching um, someone so special to Tongod communities. And for me, if you really put this story in your heart, it will make you cry. And with that, God bless. Thank you, Sylvia Jin, for what you have done to Tongod communities and to the people of Sabah. God bless. This is me, Nilo Jmich. Hi Sylvia. Oh, Say hi. Hi, Julian. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having us here. So it's um awesome feeling for me to have the experience to meet for me um it's amazing. the creation of history in Tongor. And I'm a very sentimental person <laughs> and um, I'm easily being touched with all this kind of story. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, probably um you can you can share uh, with us um, the first day, early day, um, what made you uh, come to Tongod and and your journey towards uh, <laughs> your life in Tongod and um, what do you think about the people and uh, the state of Sabah in particular? Well, banyak soalan ya. Yeah. Mana boleh jawab semua dalam satu dua ayat saja. Yes. You cannot answer in just one or two one or two sentences. I think I came to Tongwood because I'm under the Anglican Church of Sabah and uh, they had a primary school in Tongwood that started in 1960, 1959, 1960. And I was a trained teacher, so they sent me to the most remote uh, school in the Anglican uh, area, uh, to Tongwood in the heart of Sabah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we went by boat. It took us four days from uh, Sanak and it was a long journey. I firstly went on the residence launch as far as uh, Lamag, mm -hmm. but uh, all by myself. I, I was see. very, very frightened and uh, <laughs> burst into tears at Sukau and uh, they had to find out what's wrong with me. I said, I don't know where I'm going to sleep and I don't know what this man is saying to me. Uh, anyway, they eventually got me all sorted out and I met up with the bishop the next day in Lamag, uh, which has now become Bukit Gara. Yes. Uh, by the way, I was born in Lamag. Oh, really? Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> because my father um, worked as a forestry. Yeah. We were there for a few years. In Goodness me. Before we moved to Blue Run. What wow. do you know about yeah. that? That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I remember Lamag because. Um, it was very muddy, yeah. the riverbank was very muddy, and uh, we stayed in the clinic mm -hmm. when we ever passed through there and we had to stay overnight. And there were tons of rats all running around the ceiling. <laughs> it was like a big football game was going on all night long and the ceiling 
with the rats. But then it went under the floods in 1968, if I'm not wrong. And from that point, uh, it moved down to Boogie Garden. Yeah, so um, then we moved on to, finally got there to Tongan on the fourth day. And I remember the children all being at the river bank to meet us. It was dark already. Mm. We did the last part of the journey in the dark. And the children were all there. And uh, actually, I suppose they come to meet the bishop who traveled with us, but I felt they come to meet me. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and then shown to the house where I was to live. It was a very simple house. It was made out of kulit kayu, uh, bark and sticks, and uh, nibong floor, uh, and billion roof, billion tiles roof. And all I had to sleep in was an old army stretcher. That was my bed. And no proper doors or anything, because it was all made out of bark. Takali's bark. I see. Yeah. So when you arrived in Tonga, the, the, the Chinese house was already there? Ah, yes. Ah. That uh, shop house, uh, Tauki Bak Min, ah, yeah. had been there since uh, very early days. Yong Soon Company ah. ruled all the shops on the river. Ah. Your father will remember the Yong Soon Company because they served all of the places along the river, Sukau, Lamar, Pintasan, Kwamod, Karis Karis, Takulab, Kawara, Kwamod, Karamoa, and then uh, Tongu, and then Pinanga, and Pinanga. So that was the Yongsun Company, mm -hmm. and uh, the shop in Tongu was part of the Yongsun Company that had all the shops, mm -hmm. but it was under Taoki Bakmin, and he'd been there since before the mission came. The mission came in 1957, was the first uh, person to live there. Uh, but before that, the clinic was there. Mm. The clinic was run by the government on an intermittent uh, timetable. So occasionally, government officers came up to staff the clinic, but not very often. So when our Anglican priest from uh, Sandakan went in to investigate in 1956 mm -hmm. uh, the Kampong asked him to, to start uh, to provide more regular service for the clinic because the, all the diseases there at the time was TB and yours and oh, okay. really terrible, mm -hmm. a lot of deaths and, uh, and also to start a school because there had been no school. So that's, what, that's how they started, January 1958 the starting date of everything that's what's considered starting date. They actually had a man from Sarawak and it was started by five Iban men from Sarawak. Oh. So it was different, it wasn't a European mission coming, it was Iban mission, which would made it different. And uh, Anupunta, Lawrence Lowin, uh, Joseph Maja, uh, and two others came up. Mm. Five of them. Yeah. Well, was it difficult to, when you first came there, was it difficult to uh, get along with the locals? Not at no. all. No. They're very friendly. Ah, no? uh, yes. Of course, they regarded us differently. Mm -hmm. They looked upon us as somebody who came from Mars. <laughs> 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 I think they never knew what to do with me uh, until my father died in 1985. My father died. After that, they started talking about bringing my mother over, sharing a piece of land with her and letting her make a farm there. Mm. I said my mother wouldn't know anything about making a farm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it was that point they started integrating us into the tribe because before that, I mean children, little little babies used to just cry and run into their mm. father's arms when they saw me, something so strange. You know? <laughs> And also, they put your dog away on Panjang Scully, he do young Panja. Or maybe they say, say, why you from what something? Yeah. They only saw my long chin, my long nose. I remember one of the priests who's there in Pinanga now, he used to call me Long Nose. Oh, okay. It was my nickname, Long Nose. <laughs> <laughs> How about the church around there? Uh, I just started, uh, oh. 1962, I think, was the first baptism. Mm. Uh, Arno mainly, who was the one who used to go around the kampongs and uh, talk to the people about um, the Christian message. And, um, uh, and those who believed, their lives were changed tremendously. Yeah. Life was ruled by uh, drunkenness before that. 
Rawaiti. <laughs> you know Rawaiti? Rawaiti. Rawaiti is like oh. Dusun language. Let's let's dream. <laughs> Cheers. Let's dream. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, like yeah. 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 Yes. That's right. I knew I'd sort of heard it before. I couldn't remember what it meant. Yeah. So when you when when the group first came to Tonga, how many of all of you came to Tonga? Uh, well, we we. You mean the missionary group? Yeah, sure. no, we didn't come in uh, like that. We came one by one. Oh. The first one uh, to come were the Ebans. The Ebans were the missionaries. Oh. Yeah, they weren't European missionaries. They were Eban missionaries, five of them. Uh, Andrew Kiri was the first one to resident there. And then Arno Puntang. Oh. And then after that, Arno Puntang found uh, a nurse, Wendy Gray, whose book has just been published. <coughs> a midwife of Borneo and, uh, and a teacher, Joan Goodrick. And then after that, other missionaries came, but came one by one. Sort of thing. You mentioned um, <coughs> the first car to arrive in Tongan. Uh, what year was that? 5th of June 1979. Oh, so I remember a significant date. <laughs> What car was that? Land Rover? I don't what? remember what sort of car it <laughs> was. <laughs> but I just remember people gathering around and looking at this strange uh, vehicle that like came from outer space. Uh, and I remember when the road was being bulldozed in there, people would stand up on the... Uh, and they'd never seen such big building big equipment in their life. Mm. And they would just stand on the sides of the road going, wow, oh, yeah. <laughs> amazing. And that road, that bulldozer then bulldozed the roads came through. There was no such contact before that. Yeah. Um, when you were in Tomod, obviously, did you actually miss home? Sometimes, yes. Because it sometimes took six weeks, six months mm -hmm. to receive a letter. And we had no <laughs> phones, I mean, <laughs> telephones like that certainly didn't exist. Yeah. And the old fashioned phone. All we had was a radio telephone. No, we just had my uh, president of Brandon Pope here. And uh, I was just telling him about how we used to contact, uh, <coughs> the, for example, the education department. I was the principal of the school there. Mm -hmm. And we had to contact outside uh, on the radio every now and again and try and get the message across when it was so much interference. You know, They had the timber camps all contesting because they all wanted um, parts for their vehicles or other things yeah. and um, and they would um, you know you'd have to get on the line with the radio and mm. try and send uh, figures for the children in school it was really quite something but of course whenever you had an emergency a medical emergency yeah. you needed the radio but that's all we had in those days we had no other no TV no phones nothing yeah. so, so when you first introduced um English lesson in, in Tongo. Um, how was this uh, perception? I mean, how those people, the young children, receive uh, those um, English lessons? In, in <laughs> well, it was just expected you spoke English when you went to school yeah. because we were an English medium school yeah. until 1971 mm -hmm. when the Education Act uh, was in, imposed mm -hmm. in Sabah and we had to switch to Malay. And I had to do an exam to show I was going to be able to teach in Malay. And if you didn't pass the Form 3 mm -hmm. level at uh, with Kapujian, mm -hmm. with credit, you couldn't teach in the primary school. Uh -huh. So I had a friend from England and uh, she couldn't manage the Malay, so she left at the end of 1974 uh -huh. when her classes ran out. But I, was, I passed the exam with the Kapujian, don't know how I did it, uh, but God wanted me to stay, so <laughs> he enabled me to get the Kapujian and I was able to stay on and teach Malay in the school. Oh. So English was just expected that all the children spoke mm. English and spoke to their teachers in English. And they, we had a boarding house, so the children spoke English quite well actually. Oh, but sometimes they got things mixed up, like uh, they'd come and say to you, Oh, I wonder uh, when the parents would come to visit. They, we had what was called tumble houses, and you took the, you went and slept in the tumble house, and you took the children out of the boarding house, and to sleep in the tumble house. So the children had to come and get permission. They'd say, "I want to go and sleep in my mother." And I say, oh, "You haven't slept in your mother for a long time." 
<laughs> you want to sleep with your mother? Yes, with my mother. In my mother. You sleep in my mother. <laughs> Prepositions quite hard in English, eh? <laughs> so they always get their prepositions mixed up. But anyway, did you ever say that? I want to sleep in my mother. But did you, you live in the boarding house? <laughs> no, 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 not all so the time. So only those days before uh, even um, the road um, being, uh, being built to reach the road, the main transportation was by okay. river. Uh, mm -hmm. river. Mm -hmm. So in order to go to like Samarkand and other places, all by river. Really? Mm -hmm. But there, of course there will be no traffic jam usually. <laughs> <laughs> never jam. Uh, never jam. But it was a long journey uh, and dangerous. Yes. dangerous. With the crocodiles. Yes, although I never thought about crocodiles in those days. One time our boat sank down at Tidog, which oh. is below. Um, uh, below Balat, Balat Tido, mm. and then uh, Bukigaram after that. So it'd be upstream from mm. where you lived, uh, Bukigaram, Alama. And uh, <coughs> I remember a big launch came up, and it was going too fast. Mm. So the waves went right over the top oh. of our little Jong Kong, we were in a Jong Kong. And I remember uh, lying on the floor of the boat, just having an afternoon nap, and my, my students, I was taking nine students to secondary school. Mm -hmm. And my students called me Miss Jeans. They used to call me Miss Jeans in okay. those days, following my surname. Miss Jeans! I looked up and there was this big wall of water coming down on top of me. Oh, so I just grabbed my bag and, and then got out of the boat and everybody. And I saw the man in front, Lamansi. He was holding onto something going under the water. So, Lamansi, what are you doing? I'm trying to save the engine. We were taking an engine down the river. Let it go, let it go. So somewhere on the base of the river near Tidal Bay is an engine, uh, a Johnson 20 horsepower engine. And uh, then I yelled at the launch it passed by. I said, come back, get us. So sort of pushed me under the bum, going up into the boat. You know, I said, geez, so rude, this man. <laughs> Getting me up out of the river, you know, onto the launch. and. Uh, then I asked them to please send us down to um, to Bukit Garam as so we were going to be met there. The road had come through already to Bukit Garam. Mm. So once we got the road to Bukit Garam, we could join the road at Bukit Garam and go through. Oh. But before that, we had to go all the way to Sandakan in the boat. Yeah, so, they call it uh, Oh, Little, little Hong Kong. Those oh, yes, Little, little Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of. Um, happiest moment in, in Tamil. Any happiest moment that it is hard for you to forget? Happiest moment. <laughs> oh, we saw so many happiest moments. <laughs> I think there was a sense of, um, it was a surreal existence really. We were away from our own people. Um, sometimes I used to listen to the radio on a Saturday afternoon, mm -hmm. uh, to the ABC. Australia on the radio where you got the horse racing. I used to love listening to the man who was broadcasting the horse racing just to hear an Australian <laughs> voice. <laughs> there were no other voices around and um, no mail. Uh, so it was quite surreal but uh, our house used to face the western sun with the coconut trees all there and see the sun going down over the Tongwood the Tongwood River. Mm. Uh, there was something quite surreal about that and uh, just being able to have coffee in the morning. 10.30 was break time so the clinic used to break then and we came together. So I think those were happy moments really and because whenever we had visitors was a happy moment. You got mail coming in was a happy moment. Oh. <laughs> Everybody raced for the mail bag yeah. and occasionally it was left behind. No! Oh, and then it'd be blue murder. You know. oh, who left the mail bag behind? Uh, so those were happy times, oh. and um, but there were some very sad times yeah. as well. You know, when your students died, for example, mm. quite a lot yes. of my students died yes. because they're sick, malaria, yeah, like uh, malaria and yeah. Petronas, Petronias, who yeah. died of the food yeah. poisoning yeah. and the fish poisoning and so on, yeah. and drownings. We yeah. had a lot of drownings in the river. Mm. A lot of deaths. Do, do you face um, Do you face any um, problem with the food, the local food? We didn't eat the local food oh, on the whole, oh. no, because we brought our own food up from Sandakan, mm. which was tin food mainly, oh. and then we grew vegetables in kerosene tins outside oh. the door, 
and we tried to grow fruit trees, uh, papaya, sayamanis, we tried to grow and um, we had tin food and we had a little tiny refrigerator, a uh, kerosene refrigerator, which stood about that high and it had uh, a little tunnel, a little funnel in the back with a metal piece going down and um, and that was fueled by a little stove underneath. I remember one day trying to fix the S piece that hung on the end of the wire and it went straight into my arm until today I've still got the scar here and of course you just had to have local medical treatment um, get sewn up for that. Um, so that was live and when you got meat occasionally people went hunting they got deer, wild boar and we slice it up very thin slices <laughs> and stack it into a freezer area which was about that wide and about that long and that had to be had to make had to last we used to wrap our eggs in uh, tissue paper with uh, oil uh, and that made them last about six weeks our eggs so there were hardships and of course sad sad times especially when students died or when we got very sick I was very ill I nearly died of feldsparum malaria on one occasion. Yes. Um, and uh, how about the... Um, <laughs> how about those um, your your ex students um, in in Tamar? Uh, did they still uh, in touch with you? Many of them are yes, many. Because I started the secondary school as well in 1979. The uh, the director of education asked me to begin. Uh, but actually it wasn't really very good because there was no other secondary school in the area. So our students were sent down to Bukigaram to secondary school. But then they were told you can't go to school here, you have to go to school in Tongbud. So they used to gather around my primary six classroom and beg me to take them back into primary six. Okay. I said you can't come back into primary six. So I started a separate class for them. They dressed up in their secondary school uniforms and uh, I taught them anything that I could, even Jawi. I didn't know any Jawi myself but I decided <laughs> to learn some. <laughs> even Jawi. Uh, and uh, we started a secondary school and um, in June, May, May 1979. 79, yes. And um, so I ran it for the whole of the first year and then 1980 I decided I already had permanent residence with uh, thanks to Dada Harasali who helped me get permanent residence and then I, I left the school to concentrate on the work in the church because I was appointed by our bishop to take charge of the church at that point so I had 20 local churches so I had to look after in, in what time? In, uh, no, no, just in Kinabatangana wow. Kinabatangana alone we had 20 local churches and I had to look after all those churches because we had very few priests in those yes. days. Most of the priests had been expelled mm -hmm. during Tunna Staffa's yes. time and we had very few. So Lawrence Lowin was, uh, had the duty of going all the way up the Labuk River and all the way up the Kinabatahan River to bring a holy quote something. But of course whenever you had an emergency, a medical emergency, yeah. you needed the radio. But that's all we had in those days. We had no other, no TV, no phones, nothing. Yeah. So, so when you first introduced um, English lesson in, in Tongo, um, how was this uh, perception? I mean, how those people, the young children, receive uh, those um, English lesson? In, in <laughs> well, it was just expected you spoke English when you went to school yeah. because we were an English medium school. Yeah until 1971 mm -hmm. when the Education Act uh, was Im imposed mm -hmm. in Sabah and we had to switch to Malay and I had to do an exam to show I was going to be able to teach in Malay and if you didn't pass the Form 3 mm -hmm. level at uh, with Kapujian mm -hmm. with credit, you couldn't teach in the primary school. Uh -huh. So I had a friend from England and uh, she couldn't manage the Malay, so she left at the end of 1974 when her classes ran out. But I was, I passed the exam with the Kapujian, don't know how I did it, uh, but God wanted me to stay, so <laughs> he enabled me to get the Kapujian. 
and I was able to stay on and teach Malay in the school. Oh. So English was just expected that all the children mm. spoke English and spoke to their teachers in English. And they, we had a boarding house, so the children spoke English quite well actually. Oh, but sometimes they got things mixed up, like uh, they'd come and say to you, Oh, I wonder uh, when the parents would come to visit. They we had what was called tumble houses, and you took the, you went and slept in the tumble house, and you took the children out of the boarding house and to sleep in the tumble house. So the children had to come and get permission. They'd say, "I want to go and sleep in my mother." And I said, oh, "You haven't slept in your mother for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sleep with your mother? Yes, with my mother. In my mother. I want to sleep in my mother." <laughs> Prepositions quite hard in English, yeah. <laughs> so they always get their prepositions mixed up. But anyway, did you ever say that? I want to sleep in my mother. But did you, you live in the boarding house? <laughs> no, 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 not all so the time. So only those days before uh, even um, the road, um, I mean, um, being built to reach the road, the main transportation was by Boat river. river. Mm. So in order to go to like Sandakan and other places, all by river. river. Mm. Mm. But there, of course there will be no traffic jam usually. <laughs> 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 never jam. <laughs> uh, never jam. But it was a long journey uh, and dangerous. Yes. dangerous. With the crocodiles. Yes, and although I never thought about crocodiles in those days. One time our boat sank down at Tidog, which oh. is below... Um, uh, below Balat, Balat Tido, mm -hmm. and then uh, Bugigaram after that. So it'd be upstream from where mm -hmm. you lived, uh, Bugigaram, Alama. And uh, <coughs> I remember a big launch came up, and it was going too fast. Mm -hmm. So the waves went right over the top of our little Jongkong, we were in a Jongkong. And I remember uh, lying on the floor of the boat, just having an afternoon nap. And my, my students, I was taking nine students to secondary school. And my students called me Miss Jeans. They used to call me Miss Jeans in okay. those days, following my surname. Miss Jeans. I looked up and there was this big ball of water coming down on top of me. Ah! Oh, so I just grabbed my bag and and then got out of the boat. And everybody and I saw the man in front, Lamunzi. He was holding onto something going under the water. Lamunzi, what are you doing? I'm trying to save the engine. We were taking an engine down the river. Let it go, let it go. So somewhere on the base of the river near Tidal there is an engine, uh, a Johnson 20 horsepower engine. And uh, then I yelled at the launch it passed by. I said, come back, get us. So sort of pushed me under the bum, going up into the boat. You know, so I said, so rude, just this man. <laughs> Getting me up out of the river, you know, onto the launch. And uh, then I asked them to please send us down to um, Bukit Garam, so we were going to be met there. The road had come through already to Bukit Garam. Mm -hmm. So once we got the road to Bukit Garam, we could join the road at Bukit Garam and go through. But before that, we had to go all the way to Sandakan in the boat. So, so Little Hong Kong. Oh, yes, yeah, Little Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, happiest moment in, in Tongon, any happiest moment that it is hard for you to forget? Happiest moment. <laughs> oh, maybe so many happiest moments. <laughs> I think there was a sense of, um, it was a surreal existence really. Mm. We were away from our own people. Mm. Um, sometimes I used to listen to the radio on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. And uh, so I'm right on the top of that list and so everybody is part of that trip group uh, chats with me every now and again so I would say I'm close to them in that sense but I wish I was closer I wish I could know their families I wish I could visit their families and they don't visit me either you'd understand why because if you're coming from Tongwood to KK mm -hmm. usually in a hurry to go home yeah. <laughs> so you don't take a couple of hours to stop off and visit yes. here because that would make you a couple of hours later home mm -hmm. so they tend to go straight through they don't tend to stop but I was trying to persuade them to stop but anyway I've got Rostina here she's a Tongwood lady yeah. and that uh, keeps me close yeah. and uh, that's good yeah 
And um, probably before um, we end the short video, probably you have a message to all your friends back home, uh, all your ex students, and probably uh, um, anyone that have known you for years. <laughs> any, any, any message for them <laughs> when they see this video? Yeah. I would hope they would grow up in the things they've been taught. The, to live a life of honesty and justice and integrity, to do their job well, to, to believe in the God they've been taught to believe in and uh, to live their life nobly with their families and rightly. I think that's uh, briefly all I can say in a public video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, um, um, it's a privilege to actually be able to see you from a simple video of um, uh, Chinese house in Tonga yeah. lead to this awesome and amazing, amazing. discovery. The dream of um, making it a reality to meet up with the um, so-called Ibu Surya that I've been, uh, was in Tonga for so many years and still here in Sabah. Um, thank you very much and God bless.